So I got to do this since I've been doing this with everyone. I know, I know. You know this time is coming up. What's your question? Who were you in this world? I remember somebody telling me, your ego and aura arrives an hour before you do. And you know how to dance, and you know how to, you know. I don't know how to dance. I just always wanted to be the most defined, massive person on stage, but move like smoke in the air. The closest thing to perfection of physique I've ever seen is yours. In magazines, guys would say derogatory things about you. I would want to go and hurt them. And then I was told I would never beat Dorian unless I'm bigger. Did you have somebody you looked up to in bodybuilding? I hate to say this. Jesus Christ. I think the level of impact you can make moving forward is going to be much bigger than the impact you made so far. Doesn't matter, because this man right here has Olympias and I don't, so who gives a damn? They all got to come into my world to get better. That's Vinny. crazy, Flex, what you just said. It ain't a sport. This is my job. It's nothing that's altered my life greater than this, and I was built for this. Did you ever think you were made it? Yeah. I feel I'm so close, I can take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So today I have a special guest with me, possibly the most legendary bodybuilder of all time that's a four-time Arnold Classic champion. Arnold called him one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time. Ronnie Coleman, Ronnie Coleman the King, who's an eight-time champion, said he is the greatest bodybuilder of all time. And I want to read something here before we get started. Obviously, if you don't follow bodybuilding, we've done five bodybuilding interviews. Dorian Yates, Ronnie Coleman, Brandon Curry, Phil Heath, and now Flex Wheeler. Uh, with us, but I want to read something to you because a lot of times when you compete, your peers don't like you. Mm. But I just contacted Phil Heath today. I said, Phil, I got Flex coming. He has no, no idea what I'm doing. This. I said, I got Flex coming in. What do you want me to read to Flex before we get started? He says, he says he, Here's what, she, what you should tell him because he probably doesn't know this. He says, Let him know that he was the first bodybuilder other than Arnold and Lou that I followed as I saw him on ESPN and became a fan. I think this was when you and Mike Matarazzo were doing stuff back in the days. Mm -hmm. He also doesn't know this, but back in 2005, he bought me a lunch after prejudging at the MPC Junior Nationals while I only had $26 to my name. Wow. I have read his book, Flexibility, multiple times, and throughout the years, he has always shot me advice straight when others didn't. He's a legend and I'm privileged to say, I know Flex Wheeler, the man, not just the bodybuilder. Brother, you are loved by everybody in your world and I appreciate you for making the time to come out here and being a guest with us. Wow. <clears throat> Makes it difficult to get started with that, but thank you so much. It's Anytime. an honor to be here. Anytime. And uh, wow, coming from Phil. Um, actually, I do remember that now. Um, phenomenal guy and done amazing. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what everybody wants, right? Regardless of whether you're black, white, gray, antennas coming out of your head just to be accepted for who you are as a person. I, I think that's what all people strive to have. So yeah, that's beautiful. I got to text him later on and send him some money for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. You, you got him lunch back in the days. But, you know, but, but it's not just him, though. Ronnie says it about you. He says it about you. Do, do, I mean, everybody says it about you for the kind of a character you were. And obviously, we got a lot of things to cover with you here. I'd like to go into the current state of Mr. Olympia. I'd like to go into uh, what somebody like you that's been around different decades. So you can kind of see this world of Joe Weider time to then Arnold coming up and starting his own Arnold Classic to mm -hmm. now where things are, we'll get into some of that stuff, but I wanna kinda of go back a little bit because uh, I grew up uh, uh, following bodybuilding from the age of 13, 14 when I came to the States and when I joined the Army, I had all these posters on, obviously you have to be on the wall because mm -hmm. your physique is the closest thing to perfection of physique I've ever seen is yours. I don't I think, think any physique you. is the closest to perfection, but everybody goes into bodybuilding for different reasons. I know you know Fresno guy, and there's a lot of Armenian guys in Fresno, so I had a lot of friends in Fresno, mm -hmm. Bakersfield, all that. Mm -hmm. But bodybuilding and martial arts, for some people go in because they were bullied growing up, uh, because they had a girl that said, oh my gosh, I mm -hmm. like your muscles, so it's like, man, I want to get this compliment more, to prove a point to a father figure or somebody, mom, mm -hmm. somebody in the family. 
different motives that they have. What was your motive to wanting to go into bodybuilding and martial arts? Um, two of those. Uh, one, I was just brutally picked on and bullied um, as a kid. Even though I was, I was a great fighter at a young age, I just I couldn't bring myself to hit people on the street. If we were in a ring, then you know it's combat, and you know I love combat. I, it's nothing I love more, any sport more than than martial arts. Um, but it was odd, actually. Me and, and uh, Dr. Reed were talking about it. I, when someone hit me, I would just let him hit me because I would look at him and I would think, "Wow, if I kick him, what if I, what if I broke their eye socket, or what if I broke their nose, or I would think like, you know, maybe I'll just hit him in the stomach. But what if I miss and I break their ribs? So I'm thinking of hurting them and not wanting to, while they're thinking of hurting me and wanting to. And I just, I couldn't wire myself to hit people on the street. So um, actually, one of my tricks was was to invite the bully of the school to my martial arts school. And I would annihilate him there, and then he would go wow. back and tell everyone, don't fight him, you know, he, he knows. So that's the way I got around it. And then the other thing, of course, girls, I mean, I grew up in, uh, back in the 80s, wearing Britannium shirts and with the matching belt, and you yep. slip through the hood. I mean, so you gotta have arms, so, and 501 jeans, right? That's, that that's was cool. our gear back then. So it was those two things, fool, yeah, that's that got cool. me started. So Fresno, uh, you're coming up in Fresno, obviously Fresno. I don't know how Fresno was during that time, but I'm assuming it's not rough. the best place, rough. Right. Tough place, all of that. Yeah, it was kind of like back when the Crips and the Bloods first started getting down. So you just so had... Colors. So this is 80s colors. Yeah, so you got, got cousins and family members on different blocks now at war killing themselves. So it was it was interesting times back then. Yeah. Now, Flex, I watch your videos. You've been posting some of these videos of you fighting. And obviously, I went and looked at some of the other... I cannot believe how quick you are. <laughs> Were you like? Did you always have fast twitch? Like you No, uh, it was it was through the grace of uh, just meeting an incredible martial artist who's like a, a mentor to me and a, a big brother. His name is Ty McGuire, and uh, actually, um, I was in police academy, and um, I met his business partner, and his business partner was telling me how quick his feet were, and I'm like, nah, you can't be faster than me. So they invited me to a school, and. Um, and normally what you'll do is you'll have whoever the guest is fight one of your elite students mm -hmm. and you'll sit back and watch how good he is. So not meaning to be disrespectful, I just ran through all of his elite students. And uh, he kind of took it, you know, Ty kind of took it as uh, disrespectful. So he said, hey, you know, he's very soft-spoken. He goes, hey, so I was getting ready to walk. He goes, no, no, let's, um, you know, let's, let's move around a little bit. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, he just touched me everywhere just lightly, just foot here, 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 hands, just barely. So as an extreme fighter, you understand if they can just barely touch you, they could have knocked you out. It's a lot harder just to touch somebody, to throw it fast mm, enough where they can't see good it. Good point, wow. And then pull back before they hurt you. So he just did, and it just, it just emotionally distraught me because, I mean, I'm like, you know, so I ran out of the place. I was 19. I ran out of the studio, and uh, we ended up becoming good friends, and he goes, uh, you know, I said, why did you do it? He goes, well, you can't just come in my school, just, just running through my students like that and thinking that the teacher is going to be the same. I was like, okay, so I understood that. So it was from him. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of money back then, and I, uh, the school I was training at, I couldn't afford to train there. And he's, um, I tell you what, come to my school, and I'll pay for everything. Um, I'll pay for all your fighting, all your gear, and I guarantee you'll be the number one fighter in USA in, in one year. And in six months, I was the number one fighter. Get out of here. Yeah, so we just train. I mean, he would do things like call me like at 3 o'clock in the morning. Let's go train. So me, I'm just wired. I won't say no. I might not want to, but I won't say no. So we'd go and kick up and down football fields and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was just through him. Uh, it was just through him of uh, pulling out the raw talent. But like I said, it's, it's nothing better than moving around with a person or being able to execute a, a technique that they can't even see. You know, it's just... Is better than any drug I can ever imagine. So now, let me ask you, how much senior is he to you? Was, was it a generation senior where you had some kind of respect for him? Were you guys pretty oh, no, close? Oh no, 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 no. We we it was tremendous respect. Um, and he actually, what I understood later on in life, he actually showed me tremendous respect because most teachers would have went on and knocked you out because you just brutalize their students. I mean, sweeping them, stomping them, and stuff like that, and turn around and giggling and walking away. Most you know, they would take that very offensive. So he just touched me. And he would do things throughout my career. Just one other, you know, short story is um, because I was the most advanced student uh, in a school, he would always, you know, 
whatever technique he would demonstrate on me and hurt me. You know, I'd be doubled over or crying or whatever. So, but we were real close. We would hang out. Like I said, he was truly a father figure to me. Um, and finally, after a couple of years, I'm like, man, Ty, I go, man, three boys, why do you, why do you always embarrass me? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, you, you always embarrass me. You hit me hard or you make me fight you in front of everybody. And he goes, you should know better. And he would never ask me for two years. He would never ask me. And finally, I was in tears like, why, why do you do this? You know, and he just looked at me, he goes, you should know better. I go, no, I don't. Stop being philosophical and just tell me. He goes, I want to put you under so much pressure that if you ever got in a fight, you'd be able to handle it because you've been there before. I was like, damn, can't you just say that? He goes, no, nah, it wouldn't mean the same. He goes, I just want to prepare you for life. So if you fight me and you can handle me, then you can handle anyone beneath me or above me. So, I mean, what gift is that? That's, That's a incredible. tremendous gift. Yeah. That is incredible. Now, at this time, you're 19 mm -hmm. when you first uh, meet him. Mm -hmm. How many years have you been training martial arts yourself? Oh, my gosh. I started when I was uh, nine uh, after I seen the movie Enter the Dragon. So Bruce Lee was, you know, just looked up to him and just I, I got it when I seen Enter the Dragon. And I was that guy who got bullied, you know what I mean? So uh, from the age of nine, uh, um, I fought all the way till I won the California championship. So I won to California in 89, and then I went and fought that Sunday and won to California uh, and martial arts. And it was Ty. Um, I said, you know, which, which one do I do? He goes, you do which one that chose you? Again, Phil Sopper answer. I'm like, mm -hmm. come on, just mm -hmm. tell me. He goes, which one do you think chose you? I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm good at both, right? He goes, yeah, you are. He goes, but bodybuilding's chose you. I go, how, how do you say it? He goes, well, you've been doing this for X amount of years. You just started in bodybuilding. Look how you accelerated. He goes, now, I believe that you will be 10 times better as a martial artist than you ever could be as a bodybuilder. But this will be enough that I think you can beat any bodybuilding champion that, that you ever lay your eyes on. And, and he ended up being right about that. So what I jokingly, I like to post those videos because everybody kind of understands how good I was as a bodybuilder. But I'm like, you have no idea. You're quick. You have no idea. You have no idea. I mean, but it's unfair watching you like the other guys. I mean, you know, I have a, a, one of our guys. His name is uh, Shihan Alborzi. He's ninth degree black belt, mm. Iranian guy. In mm. Iran, he is uh, a very, very well known. He'd go to the Olympics, all this stuff. Now he does. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 he runs an office with us in Orange County, and I watch his kicks and I see how fast he is at his age. He's in his sixties, mm -hmm. but then he shows videos from back in the days, and you see quickness. I see your quickness flex. That's, uh, that's why I wonder, like, did you play football, basketball? Were you in all, in all of them. I oh, sucked. you sucked at all I of sucked them. I was a late bloomer. Got so, it. Um, and it was hard because my, my, he's not my twin, but he's a, a year, I think, and like six months older than me. But he's just a world-class athlete. I mean, he was the fastest man in the Valley when the West Coast Relays was in Fresno. Uh, in 11th grade, he was beating grown men. Uh, and on a football field, I just couldn't do nothing with him. Mm. You know, he was a running back, uh, got a four-year scholarship to Fullerton State. So when you're in the shadow of that, you know what I mean, you just don't think you're any good. So, um, and, and plus I was a late bloom. I was short, I had big feet, you know, trip over my feet when I'm running and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, um, yeah, but martial arts is really fit for me, uh, and I just fell in sync with it. You ever thought about if you if you go that direction where life would have gone? I mean, let's let's just say you don't go bodybuilding. Yeah. And you play that. Uh, everybody plays it in their mind. Sure. Like, what if I what if I stay in the military? Because for me, it was this close of staying in the military for 20 years. I was about to reenlist. What if I did? I would have gone out three years ago. What would life have looked at? Would I have gone and been a sergeant major? What would I have done? Right. Where do you go when you go there? What does your mind take well, you? Well, I talked to him about it, and we, we're still close to this day. And the reason he had said that is, is back then, it was very well known that if you were a martial artist and you were in a movie, mm -hmm. you would come out, do a bunch of flamboyant kicks and stuff like that to establish how good you are, and then a star of the show knocks you out with one punch. So back then, it was very disrespectful to have someone who couldn't fight but because they're the star of the show, just one punch. A stupid punch, yeah, you know, one of these that you yeah, can telegraph. That's right, yeah. And they knock you out, and that's it. So, and it was no movie, it was no money involved. So, yeah, now, I mean, it would have been great. I mean, I, I see some of the great martial artists in movies now, and I'm like, I actually did that stuff in the ring that they were doing on set, you know, where the person knows what they're about to do and is choreographed. I'm like, you know, I, I did that stuff fighting, so, but... You can't go back and what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. It'll you know? drive you insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I understand is is everything that I, I've been through to get to where I am now helped me to be the person that I am 
regardless whether it was good or bad. You take one of those away, then it's a uh, it's a table with uh, four legs. You take one away, now it's three. It's not going to be the same. So I got to embrace all of that, and I do. So, so you, you're obviously a big Bruce Lee guy. I mean, I I, I watch, read your stuff, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, if Bruce Lee was uh, on the martial arts side, who was that on the bodybuilding side? <sighs> I don't know, because it's so subjective. If we're fighting and I do a technique and you can't stop me, you know, there's no argument about that, right? But if, if two beautiful twin girls walked in the room, like ladies right now, um, it's about presence, right? It's about presence. So for whatever reason, maybe you're looking at the girl on the right more and I'm looking at the girl on the left more. So what it is is that one has presence over the other one. So you don't even give the other one a fair shake. So it's kind of like that on stage. If you walk on stage and you can just feel presence of a person walking in a room, they're already winning because eyes are going to hit them more. So mm -hmm. if I can still, if it's five of us on stage and we only have 10 minutes to display, all of us, and I still seven seconds, I mean, sorry, uh, seven seconds, mm -hmm. 10 seconds, and I sp uh, still seven seconds of that 10 is not fair for the other four people up there. So it's about presence also. So the way I present myself or a pose or maybe I smile or engage with the crowd, or whatever, all that's about presence. So it's subjective, right? Because how can you really say? That's why you have some people say, oh, so-and-so is a champion or this person is a champion or this person is the best. But if I, if I do a technique and I just knock you out, that's There's not There's no question about it. It's not. There's no question about it. Since it, with most sports, though, that are non-combat, right? Kobe's the best. No, Michael Jordan's the best. No, LeBron's the best. It's subjective because they, they're, they're not going to get down with each other that way. But in combat sports, it's different. No, I'm talking real combat sports. I'm not talking where it's set up a fight and this, that, and other. I'm mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. in its true essence. No, it's an argument in that. Did you have somebody you looked up to in bodybuilding? Like, was there somebody where you said, you know, every, you know Michael Jordan's David Thompson. You sure. know, Ronnie is Lee Haney. You mm -hmm. look at some of these guys. Was there anyone for you? Yeah, I mean, I, um, so I, you know, I come from a very humble uh, background, really poor. So my, my gym that I trained in um, didn't have many magazines. So I wasn't really brought up knowing who bodybuilders were. I, I heard of, uh, obviously, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I heard of Lee Haney, and then I heard of Sean Ray, and those were the only bodybuilders I, I heard of. But because coming back from a, a martial arts background, I understood I can learn from anyone. So it doesn't have to be somebody great. It could be the guy in the gym next door to me that's training. So I just looked up and admired everybody who accelerated in a sport. And I would steal different parts from everyone. Mm. If it fits me, I'll take this part from this guy, this part from that guy. So I just really appreciated everybody who just really was able to take it to a different level. Um, and I just tried to emulate whatever I felt that fit my reservoir. And then I kind of created my own personality and stuff like that. But I learned through the history of other guys and watching them when I competed against them. Who'd you study the most? Anybody you studied? I got, I hate to say this, Jesus Christ, man. Um, Sean Ray. Uh, yeah, Sean Ray, because um, wow, the the elegant way he posed, because um, we're looked at as Brutus on stage, right? You know, kind of like the Incredible mm -hmm. Hunk, just mm -hmm. smash, and and he was very elegant on stage, and I like that because I came from a martial arts background, so he was one of the first. But then I learned who he learned from, which he learned from John Brown, and so on. So I then start watching those people uh, compete and stuff like that, and I I just always wanted to be the most you know, define massive person on stage, but move like smoke in the air, like a ballerina on stage. Um, that was always my, my goal, this is look just ungodly muscular, but just be able to move just so fluently and gracefully and, and stuff like that, so. And, and, and you did that though. I, I, I tried, I tried. No, you that. did that, but you, what I was always curious about, you. Your posing routines, you, you would have what? You would do uh, Exhibit, Ice Cube, let me see if I can remember, LL Cool J, you would wow. do Corrupt, you would do all, I'm like, what, you know, what is he, you know, you mm. would put, and you would have them like a remix go through, are you an R&B guy, are you a hip hop I'm guy every, yourself, or? I'm everything, okay. so um, my logic to that, and it was a logic to it, um, if you go to a rock concert, as soon as the music come on, everybody goes nuts. Nobody's paying attention to nothing. If you go to a um, to listen to a symphony, everybody sits down and be quiet and pays attention. So I considered myself an artist. So that's why the first uh, we got three minutes. So the first two minutes and thirty seconds, I would have slow music because I want people to sit down, be quiet, and I want to display something for you. But I know after a while that gets boring. Just like a movie, 
and a movie it can get, take you through all these different mo emotional, but it has to bring you on the up, or else you walk away disenchanted. So I had to turn it up the last 30 seconds to get people hyped, mm. and or else they'd be disenchanted, you know what I mean, by just you know falling asleep or whatever. So that was kind of my logic, and I would always just put the, pick the hottest song at the time. And back then, that's it was you know it was West Coast, you know they were just really banging out hits. So. I wanted people to identify to the music as soon as they heard the first beat, which means they get out of their seat and they go crazy. So that I was mean, kinda, you would see that. You yeah, would see that happening. Yeah. yeah so and then you know how to dance, and you know how to you know. I don't know how to dance. Well, I mean, the way it looks like, yeah, it looks I, like you know I, what I, you're I doing. Just, I would do like maybe two or three movements, and, and that's it before people figure it out. But no, I, I just I'm a, I'm a um, I'm an introvert. So normally, you know, introverts are extroverts when they're on stage. You know. Um, so I was very, I was always uncomfortable on stage, un uncomfortable in my skin. Um, but I learned at a young age, if people find out your weaknesses, they'll use them against you. So if I walk out on stage and I'm like, then people are gonna dig deeper. Like, what's wrong with this? Oh, I see this, I see this. But if I walk out confident and arrogant, they give me a once over and then don't pay attention. Kind of like if, if I walked into this building and it smelled great, but it didn't look really clean. From the smell of it, I'm going to relax. I'm going to look around a little bit. Oh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But if the room really stunk, but it was spotless, I'm going to continue looking. Where, where is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it is on stage. If you look confident, people are going to give you a once-over, and they're going to kind of relax. But if you're up there very unconfident, and you're looking at yourself, and you're yeah. like, yeah. they're going to stare you down like, oh, okay, well, you know, what is it? And they'll start picking things apart. So that was kind of my my thought on that whole thing. Especially in the world you're in, because in the world you're in, you know, it's, it, like you said earlier, subjective versus, you know, uh, 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 you in know, your underwear yeah. in front of millions in of people. Front of, <laughs> in an underwear in front of millions of people yeah. and all that, they're watching all yeah. that. Who were who you on stage with that uh, set aside the guys that are on the uh, greatest of all time list, not those guys. The guys that never won or the guys that n were never yeah. even are no classic champs. I'm talking guys that were, that came in and they had incredible presence, but they didn't have the physique. Was there yeah. anybody where you looked and said, this guy's presence just incredible. Why mm -hmm. is he so confident in himself? Mm -hmm. Who were some of those guys? I don't, I don't remember their names, but it, I, I always admired them, right? Because you see a guy come out and maybe he wasn't in great shape or maybe even his color was off or something. But man, he just had such enthusiasm that it wins a crowd over. Mm. You know, and they'll start going like this while they're putting the crowd to start clapping. So that's that ability to cr control the crowd. And if you can do that uh, well enough and have an okay physique, you'll, you'll get by and do pretty good because you, you're selling yourself. It's, it's not always about um, how good you are on, your, on stage. It's, it's a lot of it is smoke and mirrors. Um, how well can I hide my weaknesses? And you know how how well could I uh, um, show off my strengths, and in doing so, um, will nine times out of ten have you fare out pretty well, uh, especially if you like you said the opposite. See a guy just came out on stage and he was just like ungodly, unreal, just a demigod, but he couldn't pose. You know he'd do a lot spread like this, and it doesn't matter. He can't present himself. So that's that art I think that kind of left the sport where you had to be able to present yourself at a high level or it just didn't matter when they judged us on our performance and music and our color and all that stuff is kind of gone, which I think, um, you know, a lot of us old timers, I even remember Lee Labrada telling me, he goes, Flex, I'm not going to go to the show anymore. He goes, why? He goes, you're retired. He goes, it's just boring. Guys just go up there and they just do this stupid pose. It's boring. It's not artistic like, you know, we used to do it. I'm like, yeah, you, you know, you're kind of right because it's a very subjective sport, right? If you don't know someone or have a family member or a friend or your training partner, chances are you're not going to go to a bodybuilding show. You know, it's not like basketball or MMA. You can just be completely ignorant to it and sit there and enjoy it. Our sport, you got to kind of understand what we're doing and understand the background of why we did it and what we had to go through to kind of really, you know, enjoy that. It's not just a, a visual sport where you can just walk in and just sit there, kind of like golf. I can't watch golf. But certain people who play golf, I'm interested in them, so I'll watch. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Tiger pulled me into golf. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't watch golf 100%. until he's yeah. one of the only guys I got the uh, painting on there because of uh, who Tiger was. But uh, since you brought up the the bodybuilding side, presence wise, uh, uh, out of all the guys you competed against, these are names that mm -hmm. we know. Mm -hmm. Who had the strongest presence on stage? Um, Ronnie and Dorian. 
Yeah, to me. Yeah, those are two people that um, I could feel their presence standing next to me, and I didn't like it. It was very eerie. You know, I, I felt very dominant against anyone else, and it didn't have to do with size or anything like that. Um, so those are probably the two people that, that, I, that was very eerie. If I'm, if I'm standing here and I'm looking straight and I can feel and, and see them in my peripheral vision, that's unnerving. You know, I, I'm trying to block everybody out, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So definitely, but uh, out of those two, of course, Ronnie, I mean, geez, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? You can't, you cannot work the guy because he's just a mule. He's just going to work, work, work. Um, and then, I mean, he, he t in my opinion, he's, he's the greatest Miss Olympia of all times. I don't think anybody ever break that record. And when I say record, I don't mean a number. Somebody probably get eight or nine, but they'll never beat him. You know, they'll never beat his all-time best look. It's not going to happen. You don't think so? Not going to happen. Really? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. No one's going to beat his look. Nah, not going to happen. Wow. You had him up here. You yeah. Know, it's a bold so statement. You see yeah. those, 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 those pictures he looks like. Oh, nah. I'm, I, I'm, I, I, I liked his look when he was 15th or whatever the, the year he was, uh, I don't know what the rank was, 14, 15, with two years before he went to ninth and then first. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the skinny and then the muscle, the, the way it was set up is just... Yeah. But you guys have a lot in common, though, uh, physique-wise. So Ronnie and uh, uh, Dorian, do you think presence can be taught and learned, or do you think that's something that a person has? I think it's both. Um, you can have somebody who's like a natural dancer. They just look at it and they pick it up. Mm. And then it's kind of like in martial arts. You can have somebody who's just natural. And then you have people that I fear the most are technicians. They look at you, they break down everything you're doing, and they can emulate it or stop you because they're very technical about everything, okay. You know, so me, if I was fighting myself, I'd be like, all right, his right leg is his superior leg. His right hand is his superior hand. So if I can nullify those two things, I have a better chance of beating him. Versus someone who's just gonna fight me on my mere uh, merits of, of speed and everything. No, you can't, it's, it's different. But if you're sitting there watching me and you break down my moves and I'm, I'm not gonna say, oh, but there's, 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 you know, there's a number, probably about 10 different moves I was really superior and I knew I would make contact no matter what. So if you already understood that and nullified them, now I'm in a fight. It's gonna be a whole different fight, you know? So it's the same thing on stage. You know, uh, uh, I went to Morgan Stanley Dean with his training uh, back on 9, uh, uh, 10 is when I got started, 2001, and we went to San Francisco because 9-11 happened, so we couldn't go to New York, we went right. to San Francisco. One of my guys, classmates, was a guy named Glenn Hopkins. And Glenn Hopkins was a Marvel guy. He used to work at Marvel, and he did all this stuff with Spider-Man. Just a nice. big personality wow. guy. I think his wife at the time was, uh, this is going to sound strange, his wife was, uh, remember the movie American Pie? Is it American yeah, Pie? Yeah, I remember that Stifler's movie. mom was his wife. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> I just got to put it to you. This. So, but this guy was flamboyant, and he had a great personality. I'm 21 years old at the time, okay. 22 years old at the time. He says, I'm going to teach you something. We're going to play a game. So, okay. So he takes me to this coffee shop in San Francisco, and we sit there. He says, okay, I want you to guess everyone's net worth when they come in. I said, you want me to guess what? Huh? He said, I want you to guess people's net worth. I said, what does that got to do with anything? He says, you're a financial advisor. You better be able to read their net worth. Mm. I said, okay. He says, what do you think that guy's worth? I said, the guy looks like he's rich. He says, that guy's broke. Those, uh, the watch he's got on is fake. Those shoes are $150. That, that guy's broke. I said, really? Huh, interesting. Next guy, what do you think this guy's worth? I said, not a lot. How about this guy? Finally, this guy comes in shorts, t-shirt, just a regular blue watch. <laughs> so how about this coming. guy? He says, that guy's probably worth 20 to $30 million. I yeah. said, tell me why. He says, the watch he's got on doesn't look like anything. That's a quarter million dollar watch. The loafers he's got on, that's $1,300. His shirt is a regular shirt, but it's a $4,500 shirt, and his shorts are $600. That guy's got money. Mm -hmm. We got to talk to this guy. And then he would get up and he would go talk to me. How are you? What's your name? I like your loafers. I noticed you're wearing this. And then he was a boom, cart, and then he uh, would go. Wow. So he says, you got to watch as a financial advisor. So in the bodybuilding world, because I don't know what you're looking at sure. right now, right? You look at this room in a different way than I look at a mm -hmm. room, and I look at a room in a different way than you look at a room. So when you walk into the bodybuilding world, and you're looking at each other's body, and mm -hmm. you're scoping each other out, what are you looking at? What are bodybuilders looking at with their competitors? So first thing, it's a psych out. Um, like... Even though me and Ronnie were inseparable, we're close. He'd stay at my house preparing for the Olympia and so on. And I've stayed at Dorian's house, uh, which they both talked about. When it comes to going backstage, I don't make eye contact with you anymore. Not in that way. I'll walk, hey, man, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. We'll sit, but I'm not going to look at you. 
I'm going to look you in the face, blah, blah, blah. When you're not looking, then I'll glance over. But I don't want you to know that I'm looking because if I'm looking at you, then you, you obviously look good. So it's a psych out. Um, other than that, for me, it really didn't matter what you look like backstage or getting ready for the show. It's only that 45 minutes on stage that matters. So our nerves would just blow us off. I mean, we, you know, retain sub Q water within seconds because the nervous system and everything, you're trying to work with mm -hmm, the body mm -hmm. and, and it, we can't. We're just trying to manipulate it for X amount of hours. So sometimes, and you, you've seen this, a person will come on stage and they'll look great. And as the show goes on, 10, 20, 30 minutes, they look horrible. So it never really bothered me what a person looked like backstage is what they look like on stage and how they presented themselves. Because I've been around a lot of great bodybuilders who I'll look at in the gym and they would just give me, I'd be like, how am I gonna beat this guy? One for instance is Paul Dillette. I mean, Jurassic Park, I mean, he's my training partner, or my roommate. And I look at him in the gym, I'm like, what am I gonna do about this guy? But when we got on stage, you know, um, I could just flip a switch and be a different person. And, and most of the time that was the reason why there was a difference. So none of those really factors mean anything backstage. And if you are really good, so I was also the person that if you look great or you are struggling, I'm back behind you rooting you on. It's not me and you. It's not like a combat fight where I knocked you out and taunted you while you were laying there bleeding. You know, that's kind of insulting. But it's a subjective sport. We got seven guys down there or women who are picking who's the best. I didn't do nothing to you. Why should I be mad at you that you won or lost? Why should I be mad that you're doing good? They're gonna make that decision. So just like every man or woman up there on stage, they're trying to do like you. They're trying to make money. They're trying to take care of themselves, make a living. Why would you be pissed off that this person beat you? If you really wanna be a man about it, go down and talk to the judges. Why would you disrespect this guy, say he didn't look good, or I should've beat him? That's a coward. Is that common in your world? I, I, it is now, not back in my era. Okay. It is, it is now. You, you read about it and you hear a lot of it. For me... Undermining their peers and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was going on a little bit um, in my era, but um, I never got caught up in it. You know, people would say like, you know, I'm... Um, How did the H1 taking, with yeah, the biceps yeah, and yeah, all yeah. that? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're taking food off, uh, money, uh, money off my uh, table, food off my table. And I'm like, I didn't. You might want to go talk to the judges because they're the one who gave me the knot, not you. So um, I just never got caught up in that. I mean, these people are trying to do the same thing I'm trying to do, trying to make money and take care of themselves. Why in the hell would you be pissed? Everybody would always ask me, um, you know, what did you say to Ronnie when he won in 98? When he whispered yeah, and he yeah, got yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was my friend. So I said, man, I love you. Congratulations. By the way, I'm not going to be at your victory party tonight. Mm. Why in the hell would I go? Sit there and sulk? while this man is filling on top of it. That ain't a yeah. real friend. So I went back to my room and hung out with my people and ate pizza. Mm. But why would I go yeah. there and hang out? I mean, that's not cool, so. Did you, did you have, uh, Flex, did you have the mindset of, I want to be the greatest of all time? Like, was that you? Or, or what was your mindset when you were competing? Because, uh, 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 so, so I, uh, I have clients in, in music, I have clients in business, I have clients in Hollywood, you know, sports and all that, and it's very different. One time I was in the, a couple of my clients on the, on the sports side, and they were talking about their teammates. This mm -hmm. is Sean Kemp era, if you remember Sean mm -hmm. yeah, Kemp, Gary Payton, yeah, Kendall Gill, like yeah. all that era. So we're talking about all these other players. I said, what is it like? And he says, you know, you gotta realize in basketball, once you get in and you have game and you're a starter, you got parties, you got girls, you got stuff that's happening that yeah. makes no sense. Like you can go to the mall and all of a sudden you're going into the dressing room Average man or, you know, they don't experience these kinds of things. You're driving, hey, what's up, girl gets in the car, you go, mm -hmm. you know. So the yeah. average guy who doesn't have that experience cannot really understand what it is to be you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when, when, a, when a girl is dropped at gorgeous and she's working at the mall and she's 18 years old and she doesn't yet know she's beautiful, mm -hmm. 50 guys hit on her on a daily basis versus somebody else may not experience that, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so in basketball, you go in. There, you go and you're like, okay, this is all this limelight. It's kind of cool. My, the girl in high school that was never interested, she just called me. So I got together with her and her and her and her, all the ones that I couldn't. Because, you know, in your mind, I'm not saying you're thinking that way. Yeah, but yeah, you're yeah, yeah, like, yeah, no. I got with this, I got with yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. with that, okay. Yeah, yeah. So what's left? And then, and then it's, I'm playing ball, you know, they know who I am. I'm on magazines, I'm on, you know, Sports Illustrated, whatever, on the basketball side. 
And then comes All-Star, and I've got talent where I can compete. And then mm -hmm. you got these psycho competitor guys that, like Kobe, who they all, that, like, you're, you're talking about, like, a, 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 you're talking about Ronnie. Like, mm -hmm. a, he works like a mule, you know, guys like that. Yeah. Who, who were you in this world? Um, so to answer your first question, um, I always had self-esteem problems. Um, I always had self-esteem problems, so I never believed in myself in anything. As a martial artist, I fought terrified. I fought terrified, um, and I wanted to. I always attacked because I didn't want to know what you had to offer. So I always tried to attack my opponent, and then I tried to own them within a, the first thirty seconds so I can relax and then fight better. Because when when you have me unsure of myself, I, I, I'm I'm thinking. So action reaction time, I'm already hit instead of thinking about hitting you. Um, and bodybuilding, like I said, I, I, I came across very um, cocky, arrogant, because I was terrified. You know, any of the videos you watch, when I tapped a person on the stage next to me, you know, people looked at that like, wow, look how arrogant he is. You know, he, he's showing that he's better. No, actually it wasn't. It was, I was trying to do like a sleight of hands. So if you're looking at us and I'm uncomfortable, if I put my arm around this guy, I just transferred all my energy to him. So now you're gonna look at him. You're not looking at me anymore. Um, and that was my, my, my way of trying to do that. But um, so I was wired differently, even though I, I didn't think I was good at it, it didn't stop me from just trying to kill it in a gym. Most people would say, okay, I'm not good. I'm not gonna try hard. I'd be like, I'm more or less of a, a realist. I don't think I'm that good, but man, it ain't gonna be because I didn't put everything into it. I don't think it's gonna happen, but I'm gonna go try anyway. Where most people are like, I'm not that good at it, I'm not gonna try, you know? So um, my work, I love training. Uh, you know, all we did is eat, sleep, and train. Uh, I didn't believe in video games or going out or partying. Oh, you did not? Nah, no. Nah, nah, so you weren't running around with the girls left and right partying and all well, that? Well, uh, not during training, so not during training. Oh, okay. But unfortunately, you know, they say that about athletes, but I jokingly say, in a, you know, reverse it at, yeah, but we're sleeping with normal people, so it's two of us, right? So you can't say the athletes are all bad because they're not running around sleeping with other athletes. They're sleeping with normal. So the common denominator is people do that. Don't just throw it on athletes or somebody who has mm -hmm. money or not because people just do that. So don't put it on them. Um, but during training season, I just if we went out to a club, which we talked about before, my buddies worked at a club and I did for a while. Um, I'd be like leaving by 11. So they wouldn't even go with me anymore. They're like, Flex, you gotta drive by yourself. Cause they wanna stay till two or three. And I'm like, I'm tired, man, I'm going home, I'm sleepy. Um, so, but other than that, I just, I wasn't into drinking, smoking, anything. If it didn't better me, now I had to do certain things that looked the way I did. So if it didn't better my craft, I wasn't about it. Just At all, mm. so you, so okay. So, so you weren't the party animal mm -hmm. guy? No, no. And it, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it was during my era or not because I wasn't around. My boys, we didn't get on like that. Me, Chris, Rico, they would go out and hang out, you know, to hit on girls or whatever, but that's it. I mean, we just didn't go out all the time and they went out a lot more than I did, but I just wasn't that type of guy. Sure, Remember, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm insecure, so I'm not gonna be at a club shooting at girls. That's, that's not me. I'm not gonna walk up to a girl and say, hey, you wanna dance? Because I'm, I'm fearful of getting turned down. Who, who, who was the first person in your life that said, Flex, you can be somebody in your life? Um, his name was Joe Jennings, uh, just a local bodybuilder from Fresno, and then a bigger name, uh, Jeff Lawson. You know, um, I remember them saying, you know, wow, you got great genetics. And, and in my ignorance, I'm like, what are, you, what are you calling me black? Is that a derogatory? I, I didn't know. I didn't know what that word meant, you know. And, oh, you didn't know what genetics meant? No, I didn't know at all. So how old were you when Joe Jennings said uh, you got uh, a great body? Uh, Probably about 16. 16 years old. Yeah. So father figure, any man in your life that was encouraging? My, my, yeah, my, my dad was deep into football and, and basketball. He got okay. a double scholarship. So my brother Donnell, being that, you know, he was an incredible football player and track star, it's kind of a sport in school. So everybody goes to it, right? Who's going to go to a martial arts tournament? You know what I mean? The school's there. The school is supporting mm -hmm. it. So it's, it's a big time sport. Martial arts isn't, especially back then. And then when you got bodybuilding, that's kind of weird. What are you doing? You know, why you wear those those underwear? You know, you got grease. I remember my grandmother. You know, she goes, "You look like a greased up pig," you know, <laughs> uh, in her beautiful uh, way of saying because she just didn't understand the innocence. That's yeah, great, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she was born in 1909. So, but um, yeah. So, I 
I just threw everything into it, but I was just terrified, man. I mean, if I went and competed in the Ironman or the Arnold, I'd be like, you guys got to come get me. I own this. But I don't know why. When it came to the Olympia, I'm like, I'm just going to go try and, you know, I'll settle for a second. I just never, I truly never believed I can be uh, first, number one in the world. Fear of failure or fear of success? Hmm. I'd probably say both. Both. Because both can be very damaging. Mm -hmm. Both can devastate you. Um, I would say just fear. Because, again, I'm insecure and in low self-esteem. So it was just the fear of, um, of possibly being at well. I had a lot of pressure on me already because of how good I was. So I was expected, you know, to look a certain way. And, you know, um, a lot of us believed I was judged on my best, not if I was better than other people on stage. So I remember, you know, one time I, I took, after my car accident, I broke C5 and C6. Mm -hmm. and, um, this is 94? Yeah, 94. Um, and I came back and I competed in that February after breaking C5 and C6. And I, I ended up winning the Ironman. And um, the next weekend I went to the Arnold and I took second. And when I had the car accident, you know, the company I was with, I don't want to be disrespectful, but everybody knows. But while I was, when I had the accident, while I was in the, car, in, in the hospital, they fired me. So, you know, when I got home, there was a, you know, a facsimile there that you've been released from your contract due to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. I'll be able to compete. So I begged, you know, uh, for them to keep me on. So they, they instated half my money that I was making. And I went and won the Ironman. Uh, and then I won the Honor Classic. Okay, see, I'm, I mean, I took second in Honor Classic. And uh, it's like, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I won my first pro show after my breaking my neck. And, you know, then I took second. And after Honor, he goes, we, we'd expect you to do that. You know, we expect you to win. I go, well, look, I beat all these people who've been healthy all mm -hmm. year round. And I come back from this devastating accident and I was that good. He goes, yeah, but we expect more from you. I was like, wow. So it took a whole nother, you know, at the Olympia for them to reinstate me 100%. So, um, you know, it's like a double-edged sword. It's kind of like all great athletes. And I'm not, I'm not calling myself great, but... You, you look at their best or a model, you look at their most beautiful or an actor or a singer, you know, their best song, and they're measured to that forever. So one rare thing is I kind of came close in a 90 percentile my my second show ever. So it was nowhere but either down or a little ways up from that. So and I, I just like a, a biorhythm up and down. So I was always compared to that instead of getting better and better and better. You know, I came out, um, well, when Arnold, class, uh, when Arnold called me the, one of the best bodybuilders in mm -hmm. history, that was my second pro show ever. So, you know, um, and then I was told I would never beat Dorian unless I'm bigger. So I was like, what do you mean? How do, how do I do that? You know, for, so first you're saying I'm one who of the greatest. Who, who said you can't be doing it unless you're bigger? Some, some judge. I don't even remember his name. Okay. But I, I look back what, on that. Was it a lot of people saying that? Like, was it the... the it was a size game back then. It, it had right. changed over. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember when Dorian became the first yeah. real. Yeah. Actually, it was Nasser. Actually, Nasser oh, somebody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was the first freak at uh, 280 pounds on stage. Yeah. And, and Momo. Mo remember Momo? Mo 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 Mohamed Beneziza. He was about 5'2", and he weighed like 190, 210 pounds. So it was a lot of mass monsters back then. I think Dorian was the first in our era to do that. And from then, you're chasing whoever the champion is. And I think you know, before they judged, you know, how good you were. That's why a person like Frank Zane at 170 pounds can, can be the best in the world. You know, um, it became more of a size thing. I had a sales leader one time tell me this, and uh, he made me really think. And he said, because uh, uh, I'm getting in, I'm in the financial business, and I'm competing with these other guys. And obviously, you got a competitive nature, so you're kind of looking at everybody. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this guy, degree good market, good background, parents together. Mm. I'm looking at all this stuff with them, right? And I'm like, how do I? How the hell do I beat this mm -hmm. guy, right? And I'm like, man, I don't know if I can beat this guy or not. And then this guy sits me down and tells me the most ridiculous thing and messes with my head flex, okay? He says, Patrick, let me give you where your advantage is. I said, tell me what it is. He says, uh, you don't have a market, so you have to learn how to prospect. I said, okay. He says, you don't have a last name, so you have to make your last name. 
you don't have a degree, so you have to read the books. Mm. You don't, he says, you don't, have, you don't speak as good English as the other guys, so you have to improve. Mm. He says, that guy is getting into this business. He's going to beat you in the first 24 months more than you are. But in the 10th year, maybe it's not going to happen. Mm. Would you say there was an aspect of the game that it came way too easy to you because you came in and you're just... I mean, it, it, you know, you look at some of the pictures, Flex, it doesn't even make sense what you <laughs> look like. Now, I think the greatest picture ever taken in bodybuilding, if you ask me, I mean, it, it, the greatest picture ever taken in bodybuilding, I don't think there's a better picture than this in bodybuilding. I don't think <laughs> there is. I think um, this is by far the greatest picture taken in bodybuilding where you almost don't think that this looks like a mythical mm -hmm. god, like a Greek god from back in the days that... David is working on the <laughs> statue. Beautiful, thank you. And this is it, uh, right? Yeah, Gary uh, Phillips, a good friend of mine, took that photo. Um, and I, I wasn't even trying to pose. I was getting ready to hit my next pose, which is that That's one there. That's what the makes bicep. it perfect. That's what makes it like perfection. Because to me, obviously, this is a great pose as well. But Flex, I got to tell you, to me, this yeah. is in a whole different league than that one when you look at the physique. But going back to it, how do you process that question? Like, do you think it was? You're 100% you're, you're right. Um, because I was very ignorant to the sport and the history of it and how hard people had to try to get there. My first pro show um, was against uh, Vince Taylor, and he was ranked number three in the world. And I beat him um, minus uh, one point from being a perfect score. So in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, this is a fluke. You know, he's, he's dialing in for the Honor Classic next week. That's when he's going to, you know, show us he's a seasoned veteran. And I end up competing against him and um, Lee Labrada. So I got number rank two in the world and number rank three in the world. And I beat them both with a perfect score. Um, and then I go to Germany and France and I beat Vince again with perfect score. So it did kind of happen easy. And I just, like, okay, this is just the way it is. You know, why, why work harder or why try to better yourself? And... 94 happened, I had a car accident, and it was a challenge from then. But I, I agree with you on all points, including just my pure ignorance of the sport and not really just understanding the gravity of being number one, Mr. Olympia. I just, it didn't appeal to me. I competed based on generating money. Uh, I was poor, I came from welfare, homeless yeah, and all that, so I, relate. I, I, I just competed based on generating money and mm -hmm. I knew in certain shows if whoever beat me before, so if it was Dorian or Ronnie, if they wasn't there, I'm going to wipe everybody. Mm -hmm. So I went to shows based on being able to generate money. If I had to run into Dorian or to Ronnie, then I'd look at, okay, how much is second prize? That's worth it. Go in and shut that down and hold it in second. Who was in your ear? Because, like, was Joe Me? in your ear? Was, was Joe Weeder in your ear? Was there anybody like that in your ear saying, hey, Flex, I just want you to know, go talk to this guy. Hey, look, spend some time with this guy. I need you to go over here. Was there somebody kind of like course, you know, kind of giving you the direction where Dean Smith to Jordan or right. Phil to Jordan? Did right. you have somebody like that? No, because nobody knew it. I wasn't honest about it back then. I remember I came across extremely Jackson, arrogant, yeah. you know, my swag. and yeah. it's not, I didn't know what that was, but, I mean, I, I honestly created, now understand that I created this alter ego Flex mm -hmm. Wheeler guy because mm -hmm. Ken Wheeler was, wasn't that guy, mm -hmm. you know. So I didn't know it. So you, you didn't think you had to give me advice because, I mean, I'm just, just fully swagged out. I remember somebody telling me your ego and aura um, arrives an hour before you do because you're so arrogant. And it goes, and when you walk in a room, we can just, just share arrogance. And I, I, I understand that now because when I watch any of my videos of me talking, I have to turn the volume down. I can't stand it. Just such an arrogant, pompous, you know. So I can't even listen to myself, so I get it now. But it was all trying to hide the, the real person, you know. I call myself the world's greatest chameleon. So, yeah. So, no, I didn't get advice like that because I, I came across arrogant and like I had it all. So, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 um, I, think, I think in that game, like in, in, in the race car, you know, this painting uh, right here mm -hmm. where you see me standing and whispering something in Tupac, mm -hmm. there are guys uh, standing right next to me. His name is Ayrton Senna. To me, it's the greatest race car driver drive of all time from Brazil. I named my daughter after his last name. That's wow. how much I love this guy. I mean, wow. I watch this guy's documentary, Flex. I'm in wow. tears. I have to watch it by myself because wow. I can't have my kids see this thing. Wow. It's very difficult for me to watch this guy's documentary. And my wife and I got into a debate to want to name my daughter Senna. And she said, we can't name our daughter after a race car driver. I said, babe, forget about that for a second. We have the baby. Ten minutes, baby shows up. Doctor's like, we need to get the kid's name. 
I said, I, we don't have a name. Nurse comes in. I said, nurse, we got a name for you. Madison, I give all the names. I said, well, you can't name him Madison because the girl next door just named their kids Madison. Okay. So my wife's like, okay, great. And then I said, uh, uh, Danica. I says, you can't name him Danica because I read a book when I was younger and the main character was very evil and her name was Danica. Danica. I would name her. I said, how about Senna? She says, that sounds like a flower. There you <laughs> go. And that's how we got the name Senna. But in the documentary Flex, it's he and another guy named Prost. And Prost knew how to play politics, and Senna didn't know how to play politics. Senna was horrible at it. By the way, yeah. Prost won five championships. Senna won three. There's no way Prost is in Senna's league. Mm -hmm. It's no debate mm -hmm. about it, right? I fully and understand. Senna was horrible with politics, mm. okay? He just wasn't good with politics, so it hurt him all the time. Mm -hmm. Said so it would, you know, say, no, you didn't win this race, no, you cheated, no, you did this, all this stuff to just kind of go against him, to the point where he almost walked away from the game and said, forget about it, I'm never gonna race again, I've right? Been there. Uh, how did you handle the politics side of bodybuilding? Knowing if you fight somebody, you knock me out, you won the match, but in bodybuilding, it doesn't matter. How do you play that part of the game? I didn't do well with that, because I come from, I won't say the streets, but I come from, you are who you are. You, you know, I come from, if you, you stare at a person too long, they're gonna look at you like, what's up? And you say in return, what's up with you? There's no more words. You walk towards each other and you're fighting. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that was really difficult um, for me because in magazines, you know, guys would say derogatory things about you. And me, in my, my adolescence, um, I would want to go and hurt him. I mean, you can't get away with talking about a kid down the street because he's going to come holler at you. Y'all heard you said something about me. Now you got to fight. So for me to hear and read people say certain things about me in a magazine, and it's global. So I'm like, wow, these people probably think I'm a punk. And if they know that I'm, I was an okay fighter, they're going to think this guy's really tough because he's mouthing off. So I, I didn't handle it well at all. Um, and then as far as magazines, they were pretty hard back then, you know, they, oh, he looked as smooth as a baby's ASS. That was very, very straightforward. I want to go and hurt him. You know, that was my thought. So I didn't do well with it. Um, you know, a few meetings and, and so on, I, I didn't do well because I didn't know how to play the game. I thought you just respected by your merits of being a real man. And it's not like that. Business isn't like that. Mm -mm. Globally, it's not like that. But at that time, coming from Fresno and me being skinny, Kenny inside, I just didn't see it, didn't see it. So, you know, I wore my, my feelings on my sleeve. Um, you know, um, I'm very emotionally driven. So if you hurt my feelings, I'm going to let you know it. Um, tears would be coming out my eyes. And I remember having to say to a lot of guys, hey, I can't control these, but I can control these here. And you're about to find out. So they look at you and think, oh, you're, you're wuss, you're crying. Like, I can't do nothing about these but I can do something with these. So, you know, um, so yeah, it really hurt me. Um, and I, I look back at it and I just, now I'm okay with it. I am who I am. You know, for me, um, I have to be able to go home and look at myself in the mirror and say, you're still a man. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe in selling out for something more and being able to go back and say, yeah, you're still a man. Cause for me, you're not, you're not a man if you sell yourself short or, you got to be phony in, somebody, in front of somebody's face or even with Ronnie, people are like, do you regret telling Ronnie all the secrets? I'm like, for one, they weren't secrets that were taught to me. I go, but how can I sit and consider myself a real champion when I know that I didn't tell them everything I know and didn't do battle with them? Mm -hmm. I know that, mm -hmm. you know, he has some, some, some artillery that he doesn't know how to use. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't regret it. I want to compete against the best. And if you get me, great. See you next time. You know, we're going to go at it. But I just... I'm not wired that way, I can't. And if that means that I can't be number one or the best or the most richest, then I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be me than, than not. You know, I, I've talked to Phil, I've talked to Dorian, I've talked to Ronnie, and I've talked to Brandon Curry. Yeah, on I've different seen all the interviews. Yeah, so yeah. You, know, you know, some yeah, of the yeah, questions yeah. I yeah, ask. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm more, because I run a business, this is an entrepreneur channel. Of I've course. only done five bodybuilding videos. We got 1,100 videos, they're all business and mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And I oh, appreciate you even giving our love some sport, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of this sport. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of this sport. But I also look at it and I say, you know, something's got to change because if it goes like this, I don't know how many more times you're going to be able to afford to do the events at the arenas that you're doing at if you go the way you're going. There's got to be something creative taking place. 
How do you see the world of bodybuilding today versus a decade ago versus the era that you came out of? What is the biggest difference? Um, one of the biggest difference I see is ability to generate money. Um, the ability to generate money. Before it was Joe, um, Joe Weider. He was the only one who was handing out contracts. Um, and he pretty much had at least 20 of the greatest bodybuilders of all time under his table. And it was amazing. Um, and then came along all the other supplement companies and it started to get frail. They didn't have to offer money anymore to the greatest. They started doing things like, I'll give you product. Mm. Of course you're gonna give me product. You want me to use it. So they started doing that. Um, and that started causing division, I think, amongst athletes because for an athlete like myself, I'm trying to feed myself and take care of my family. This isn't fun, you know. Um, people get mad at me, like even Dorian would say, you know, how could you say that? I'm like, no, I, I do this for money. It ain't a sport, man. I pay my bills with this. This is my job. I wouldn't be doing this if I couldn't make money. Um, so that it, it's really fragile things. Um, I think uh, the internet is a double-edged sword. It's beautiful because you can go out and you don't have to pay, what was it, like 20 grand for an ad. Mm -hmm. You can advertise yourself yep. for free. So, but the other part of it is, is you know, you can falsify things, uh, camera angles, uh, you know, Photoshop that they have now with digital cameras yep. and all that stuff. So, you can be make believe also, which I still think is a craft because it's open to everyone. So I, I don't, you know, a lot of people get upset with them, what they call the YouTubers or the Instagrammers or whatever, that field is open for everybody. Mm -hmm. Man, go down, it's an even field, mm -hmm. get down, yep. you know? So I'm not mad at them. Um, now that you have all the various different federations, I think it's really took a change and there's some things that are happening in the background that I can't say, but is really going to shake the sport to its core. Um, on the upside of it, a great thing that's about to happen next year uh, actually this year is The Rock's going to put on his event mm -hmm. in Atlanta and I think with his uh, his love for the sport which I've, I've talked to him privately back when he was wrestling he just loves working out you can see it in his videos the dude take Absolutely. a gym everywhere all over the world yeah. I mean he loves it more than I do yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot more than I do so I think he, he he's good for the sport though, he's, he's great doing. for yeah, the sport he's, very good he's for great the sport. for the sport because I remember back in Arnold's days Chevrolet and ESPN were all they were sponsors even during my era ESPN was a sponsor we were on TV national network you don't get that anymore so there's not a draw there's no ability to make money and at the end of the day if you don't water the grass, it's going to die. And I just don't think the sport was watered the way it possibly could have. Um, marketing is everything. You know, um, it's interesting that you can have a little cartoon doll that looks like this, but me walking around like this is not viewed at as good. But your kid can play with a toy that looks identically like me. That's a marketing problem. You got to market that better, you know, and switch that around because it's acceptable, right? We all have seen it. He-Man, She-Ra. They're all basically walking images of us, but us walking around can't get on TV mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So that's a marketing problem that I think fell through. So I think um, with The Rock and his power and everything that he's bringing can truly upside the sport and bring back where there's money um, in a sport. And my last thing on that is, you know, when you want to be the best in the world, it doesn't have anything to do with health. It don't. It has to do with being the best in the world. Now, um, if I want to take boxing at, I ain't going to say a, a gym's name and give them any props, but I want to take boxing at a gymnasium. Okay. That's healthy, right? Cardio, boxing, it's not another. Fighting Mike Tyson, that's not healthy. It's not. It's not going to be healthy. It's not going to end well. That's the difference between just doing something and trying to be the best in the world, okay? If I want to go jogging, great. Good for you. But you see the guys at the Olympics, they're projectile puking while they're running. You mm -hmm. think they're healthy? No, they're pushing their bodies to the outer limit. It has nothing to do with health. So there's a difference between trying to be the best in the world and just doing something for health reasons or whatnot. I'm an extremist, and you know I try to be the best at what I can do. Um, but it can be marketed a certain way, and there has to be a difference in that. So um, hopefully it swings back around and, uh, and gets better. Uh, because I truly feel that working out is the essential to every sport. 
I don't got to go play basketball to be a better bodybuilder. They got to come in the gym to be better at their craft. Interesting point. I don't got to play football. Very interesting point. I don't got to run track. I don't got to hit it, swim, uh, swim. I don't got to have a tennis racket. They all got to come into my world to get better. So how can we not be the beginning? That's crazy, Flex, what you just said. How can they not? Who's selling it that way, what you just said right now? I'm, I'm, I've always said that, but I've never seen it being so... So how can all these other sports make millions, yeah. but they got to come into my world to get better at it? But me and my world You don't have to go have, in their world. No, and we don't get the same accolade that they get. That's really ASS backwards, isn't so, it? So you know what's crazy, what you just said? So I'm, I, I, I get into the financial business and I decided to go into insurance. So I start selling insurance instead of stocks. But I'm serious 766, but I'm, mm-hmm. I decided to go insurance. That's mm-hmm. my niche, because you're looking at at some point in financial, within your first two to five years, you're going to say money under management, you know, uh, uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, commodities, futures, real estate, or insurance. Mm. I said insurance. Mm. It's the direction I went because mm. everybody was chasing everything here, mm-hmm. so I went this side. When Every, I went everyone into, and all those other ones, they're going to need insurance. That's exactly right. You don't right. have to be in one of those other ones. That's exactly right. So I went into insurance, and in the insurance side, I went and looked at everybody how they told the story. I said the, t- the story's not being told properly about insurance. It's just not being told properly. Mm-hmm. Then we started telling the story in a different way than the industry was saying. Then all of a sudden, boom, we go from zero, 13,000 agents, our conventions. Uh, we just had a few months ago, President Bush is at the event, Kobe's there, we got 7,000 people there at MGM. We're about to do that at the MGM. That one was at Mirage. Kevin Hart was at our event a year ago, year and a half ago, performing comedian at the top of his world. Mm-hmm. We told the story in a different way. I don't think today, Bodybuilding's being uh, sold no. properly. No. I don't know the ownership personally. I mm. want you to know I, I've been reached out by some of the management team and mm. we're having some conversations, mm. but I don't know the ownership team uh, mm. uh, of the uh, 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 Mr. Olympia brand. But either they have to sell 51% or bring somebody to start selling this thing to team up and bring in business people, the right voice, the right face, doing something to the game for yeah. it to change. Or else, very soon, either Mr. Olympia is going to go become lower and lower. Why would I put my body through for $400,000 a year? Income? There you go. Not going to do it. There you go. Or a rock going to take it over. Or eventually, an Arnold will get more attention. Classic. Uh, I just think there's got to be something done to uh, the Mr. Olympia brand. Because like you said today, everybody else has to come to your world. You don't have to come to their world. No. Who, who's today's Joe Weider, by the way? I would say there is no replacement for Joe. No, there's no there's no entity that is giving kids an opportunity to make a living in their sport without having to go out and work a nine to five on top of it. There's no one who's doing it at the level Joe did. Uh, he was an alpha and omega of that. And and now understanding business and being behind behind it, he lost money every year. Who did Joe did? Joe did lost money every year and he put so much and he put so much into the Olympia that he literally lost money every year but it was his passion and his love for the sport that's the story of Enzo Ferrari that's the story of uh, you know Walt Disney that's the story of any of these guys I mean but look with the it's it's short-term thinking versus marathon versus a sprint that's right and they weren't thinking sprint Joe never thought sprint he always wanted to sport in the Olympics I actually didn't want to be in Olympics, and I, I was against it because he, I was wrong, okay? Um, I should have wanted, I should have wished for it because, yeah, you're an amateur and you don't make any money, but, wow, the money you can make after that. I was just thinking short-term. Olympics. Exactly. I was thinking short-term because I need money now. I don't want to compete in a show and put my, right. thought, my body through the abuse and, and then hopefully someone like me and, and market me. So, you know, I, I, I wanted immediate gains and gratifications because I had immediate bills and you know so on. That's so. a good point. Because but there's no there's no replacement. So there's no there's no replacement or there's nobody like no, him. No one like him. Okay, so let's just Period. say we can't replace him. Fair. But it y- could be done. Okay. It, it could be done. Are there personalities like him right now that you would say no. if one had like 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 let me give you some names on what I'm saying. Okay. Like Bill Phillips loved bodybuilding at one point EAS. You know, he was good with the whole contest promotion. Yeah. He was a marketer, by yeah. the way. Bill Phillips is a ridiculous marketer, he you is. know that. He is. So Arnold was a great storyteller. Oh my God, look at his muscle. I've never seen the separation like this before. And you hear right. his voice, right. his passion, like he looks at you know, by like, look yeah. at this guy's body. So you were kind of like wanting to impress the guy because it's gotta be a personality to do that. Sure. Is there anyone that we don't know about that maybe you know in your world to say, if that guy really wanted to come out or if this guy wanted to come out, he could do something? Maybe a pre-Mr. Olympia or um, pre-somebody else? 
Out of the two you mentioned, it would be Arnold. And I think he hasn't been allowed to. I've heard conversations that he wanted to make the prize money more and wasn't allowed to for various different reasons. I think he, he super exceeded that by having, uh, I forget how many, over 20 more sports than Olympics now. He's achieved that in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't say that me and Arnold are friends. We're really close. Um, I remember you know, going into the Nike uh, store and he was there and I won, I think, the Arnold twice. I don't believe in impeding on people's private space, especially somebody like Arnold. So I, I was walking around him. He's like, hey, Flex, what are you doing? And gave me a big hug, sitting there talking to me. Long story short, I'm about to pay for my, my clothing and he's getting his for free. He's just signing, you know. And he goes, um, you know, and he's very, I don't know if you ever talked to him, very quick wit. I mean, wow, he's quick, right? He goes, Flex, what are you doing? I go, paying for my stuff. He goes, no, what are you doing? So I think he's about to go and joking. I go, I'm paying, you know what? You're paying for my stuff. You pay for it on. He goes, no, seriously, what are you doing? I go, Arnold, I'm paying for my shit. And he looks at the lady, he cusses her out. He said, get the manager down here right now. The manager came down, you know what this is, this blah, 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 blah. You got these god doggone football players and basketball players, you give them a free gear. You have any idea who this guy is? Take it, threw the stuff back and walked out. And right then I understood where this guy's coming from. This sport gave him everything. He came here ass poor. Gave him everything. He believes in his sport. Hence the reason why he puts on one of the greatest competitions in the world. He's trying to better it because it gave him everything. Everything he done spawned from this sport. And I understood him fully in his inner city youth gangs that, uh, uh, that he goes and mm-hmm. he's involved in. He invited me to come and speak at one of those and, and wrote some incredible words on a picture that he gave me. So he identifies it at the underdog. A nobody, you know, like he wrote in his book, he was beat up by his older brother and his dad didn't like him because he thought he was a weakling, you know, so I, I get that whole entire thing. So I think he has taken broad steps to try to change it, even talking about the bloated guts and how embarrassing it is. And I think that made some changes the following year. But anyone else? No, not even on the radar. Not on the radar. If nothing not happens, in my, not, not in my knowledge. If nothing happens, if nothing changes, what, what do you foresee happening to the brand in the next five, ten years? Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't really see the sport dying because, like I said, it's the essence of everything. I see an opening for people like The Rock or people who may have a greater global appeal being and coming in and settling down and doing something great with it because it's a winner. You know, like you said, you tell the story properly, it's the truth. You can't get it down. I mean, you got people who don't even give a damn about doing anything, but they come into my world. Mm-hmm. There's more of them than anybody. So. Do the guys at Mr. Olympia call you? Do they call you to talk to you? Do they call you for counsel? The guys that are running Mr. Olympia, ownership team, you know, CEO, CMO, are you talking to those guys? No. So you, you got out of your surgery that you in the last two months? Yeah. Oh, they, um, um, a few. A few reached out to me. Um, a few reached out uh, to me through other people. Um, it was people were aware that I was in a coma and I was in a hospital for uh, for three months. Um, so when I came to the Olympia, they threw out the red carpet, gave me VIP tickets, okay. set me right up in front, uh, and everything. And I was beautiful. Um, and they were really gracious, uh, you know. And, and since this happened, actually, the the new person who took over the Olympia, he actually came to the hospital and visit me after uh, my respect. and That's everything respect like that. Tremendous, that. tremendous. And he That's sends me messages, you know, flex, you know, same thing. I think you're going to change the world based on what you, you're going through now in your mindset. And, you know, I'm Is really happy about this. Is this the new CMO this. that took over Mr. Olympia? That, uh, yeah. Dan? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Dan. good. That's, yeah. that's yeah. great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. That's very yeah. great yeah. to hear yeah. for that yeah. to be taken And place. me and Dan have always been close. Um, he was actually, um, he was one of the major influences on, on me getting the uh, Ben Reader Lifetime Achievement Award um, two years ago. And he was the one who actually handed that out to me on stage. So he's always been really nice. Um, so a lot of the independents, Jim Mannion, uh, reached out through Robin Train, who's a friend of mine, and said, hey, let Flex know if he needs anything, let me know. That's um, great to hear. Yeah. The, um, the Lormers, who puts on the Honor Classic, yeah. uh, reached out to me and said, you know, Flex, uh, you know, bodybuilding community is behind you. You know, we love you. I want to invite you out as my special guest. So he's bringing me out to the Honor Classic. And he goes, you, you're getting VIP service everywhere and want you to hand out the uh, overall um, 
IFBB wheelchair uh, award. So yeah, uh, beautiful support, uh, beautiful support from my community and I graciously appreciate it. I, I think that's very important to do to the alumni because that makes me want to represent the brand knowing they take care of the guys in a past who brought so much exposure to it. I think mm -hmm. it's a very smart move. Any unique Joe Weider stories you have? Any, any experiences with Joe yourself? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I was a bit of a hot hit and, uh, you know, combated. And I remember um, getting on the cover of Flex Magazine a lot and Flex, Mag Flex Magazine's all over the world and other magazines covers all over the world, but I never got a, a Muscle and Fitness cover. And, uh, never. Never. No. And I remember talking to Joe. I was like, Joe, I'm like, you know, how come I can't, you know, get a cover on Muscle and <laughs> Fitness? And he goes, Flex. And I think he was truly being brutally honest. You know, he said, Flex, if I put you on a cover, I'm going to lose money. I go, what do you mean by that? He goes, I said, I'm on covers of various different magazines all over the world. And he goes, well, my logic is all over the world, you're not intimidating. They don't see you that often. You know, they don't see black athletes that often. He goes, here in the United States, you're more intimidating. So if I put you on a cover, you know, I feel that I'm going to lose money. He flat out told you that. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, you know, Joe, I'm like, you know, there's, there's some brothers that got money too and want to buy a magazine and see somebody who looks like wow. me on there. And he goes, okay, Flex, I'll do this. I'll put you on a cover. If I lose money, you pay me back the money I lost. If I make money, I'll share the money that I want. <laughs> Pure business Brilliant. guy. <laughs> Brilliant. He so goes, what did you, you say? say? I said, no. He goes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, exactly. I can't take that risk. So, but was he a guy you trusted? Was he a guy yeah, that... Yeah, uh, I do. I, I, I do. And uh, I recognize the trials and tribulations he was going through. And now I really recognize the financial strain that it caused him. And I owe everything to him. If it wasn't for that man, you know, who created this sport and poured so much into it, I don't know where I'd be right now. And, um, and I appreciate that was a lesson. I get it more now than I did. And I even said, I said, Joe, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're Jewish. You know, you know how hard it is, you know, to be. And he said, yeah, I am. He goes, that's why I can't take that gamble. You know, I go, but you can be the first of it or many things. He goes, I already offered you a deal. Take it or leave it. I had, to, I had to say no. Negotiator, a yeah. nonstop negotiator. You, you know, the, the way I look at it is, it, it maybe in a different angle, and, and, and you can challenge me on this. I think you have a certain level of wisdom others don't have access to. And that's why sometimes guys like you become the greatest coaches of all time and mentors of all times, mm. and advisors of all time. And you never know why this happened. Like, why did I get dealt this hand? Man, I could have been like, why are you doing this to me, God? Like, put me out of this flipping misery. Yeah. Like, why are you taking me here? And then, but what is this all about? What is your, and then sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a bigger story and you don't know what it is because Agreed. it's like, you know, uh, for me, I don't know why I live the life I live. Am I having a kid that's going to be a president one day? What are you doing? Why are you putting me through this stuff that I experienced mm. with the war? Mm. So then I have to kind of sit back and say, well, just rest some patient. Maybe there's something going on here. And you gain a certain level of lens that another person that doesn't have, that if you run into the next flex, you can give him direct. And he has to take it from you because you have moral authority. So he knows you're not coming from a place of motive. Mm. You're coming from a place of wanting to give direction because... I'm a big Tupac guy. I don't know if you're a Tupac uh, guy. Of course I'm a, I'm I am. I'm a big diehard Tupac guy. Of course. Right? And of course. When he, it was he was a genius. September 23rd, 96. I don't know when it was, when he, when he passed away. But uh, uh, for me, I, I think about it. What if somebody else was in that guy's ear when he was younger? What, what if there was somebody else that was, you know, speaking to him behind closed it doors? All, it was all a negative crap. Uh, yeah. What if yeah. Antonio Brown has somebody else in his ear? Mm. What if there was another person, like even as a... By the way, his agent today, I don't know if you saw what he did or not, his agent today cut him. He says, I can't do it until you decide to change yourself. So his own agent. So what if somebody's in Tupac's ear? Tupac could have been a political figure today doing rallies. So, so I, I, I look at you and I see, a, a, I see life just getting started if you're able to channel your wisdom because that's not, worth, uh, uh, that's, that's not only worth millions of dollars that you can't, you can't buy this. Mm. It's... It's a certain level of social capital experience that somebody has to extract out of you. 
if you were to sit down with somebody and say, listen, let me just tell you, here's the flaws, and you're, you seem like you're in a place where you're willing to talk about oh, some of this stuff. Oh, 100%. The value there, flex, priceless. Mm -hmm. The value there, then you got a Tyson story. I put you, Tyson, there's certain stories there yeah. that you, you look well, at that. Thank the, you, yeah. that's incredible for you to say. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I believe everything, like I said before, happened for a reason. And, um, you know, even to, you know, the amputee and everything that just happened a few months ago, um, I think they're all blessings. Um, you know, I, I understand it, but it's nice to rehear it because, you know, from just, just millions of fans, you know, when this happened, it's like, you know, God only gives his greatest battles um, to his turning his warriors. So, <clears throat> it's tough. Those are big time fights. But I'd rather take on those. So I, I greatly appreciate what you're doing. I know I'm, I'm actually trying to um, home in those skills now. Uh, a number of things that me and Dr. Reeves are doing now um, to try to home in those. Because it's, it's, for me, it's more powerful giving back. I've, I've had millions, I've had cars and girls and houses. And you know, for me, because of the way I'm wired, those are just big black holes. They just suck up and want more and more and more. So. You know, I find that now giving back in those various different ways, whether it's, you know, for me being, you know, suicidal or depressed or any of these battles that I have, I think I've been able to go through those battles to turn around and hand them uh, some lemonade instead of lemons. Because life is going to do you lemons no matter what. So my thing is, is if I can cope with these lemons that I've given in life and turn around and, and, and share a cup of uh, lemonade with you and serve it sweet, then you don't have to go through what I went through, you know, and learn. So that's just a beautiful thing. Money can't buy that, you're right. There's certain things that you can do that just doesn't equal to money because we both know major millionaires and so on who are most unhappy, mm -hmm. you know, gutless, worthless people. So what does that really mean, you know, when you say that, you know, you have millions or whatever, you didn't tell me anything. Actually, you told me a lot, because if that's the first thing that comes out of your mouth, you just told me you're pissed poor morally. So you basically broke, you know, so. But I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's my observation, man. I think, you know, uh, the guy sitting across from me was an 18-year-old kid who admired you and looked up to your stuff, and I couldn't believe that, you know, a, a human being can be created with this perfect sy yeah. symmetry like this. You know, the level of admiration a bunch of boys had like me growing up. I, I, I don't think I've heard you... Uh, uh, fully comment on how you're processing the whole, uh, you've been through different challenges in your life. Mm. Health, you know, a car mm. accident, mm. close calls, yeah. even life and death type of situation yeah. on one of them with your neck. I mean, yeah. that was not a regular thing. And then now with this, how, how different is this than the other experiences you've had? This is the most challenging, obviously. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've had probably, I stopped counting at like 60 surgeries. A lot of them I didn't even uh, come out in public and talk about. Um, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, it's interesting, it's, it's hard to put in words, you know, it's, it's nothing that's altered my life greater than this, and I think, um, you know, even my doctors were trying to be psychiatrists and help me, they were trying to, you know, explain to me, like, this is going to be a lot tougher than you for most people because of where you come from and what you've done, but, um, it's it's emotional roller coaster. Um, you know, it just changes your perspective and everything. I, I remember doing a video and, and saying it's different looking at things four foot tall because when I'm in my wheelchair, I'm about four foot mm -hmm. high, mm -hmm. and everything is different. Um, you think about things that you didn't have to. How can I get to the restroom? You know, in time. You know, um, being in public and toilets are the worst in public. You know, what I have to carry with me to make sure I'm okay with that. If I'm watching a movie or if I'm driving, you know, how quickly can I get to a bathroom? Just things you don't think about. Getting yourself dressed. Um, all those things. But what, what I take from it and where I get my strength is, you know, um, I was built for this. Yeah, I was built for this. I think every battle that I had um, emotionally and physically was preparing me for this one. And I remember um, when I, I had to make the decision for them to take it because, like I said, you know, um, it was a DVT that they found in February. And I was in a hospital actually from March for like four, three months. I was in a coma for 10 days. And um, 
in the surgeries that they tried to do to save my leg, I knew they weren't working. So I was just in extreme amount of pain for the last, uh, you know, five or six months. It was just ridiculous. So I remember going into the hospital after coming from a trip actually with uh, my business partner and I called my wife and I was like, you know, I think I need to go to ER when I get off the plane. She's like, all right, I'll meet you there. Um, <clears throat> and they went in uh, did an ultrasound and said, okay, they came back like, you know, uh, the right side of your calf is 90% blocked and the left side uh, is 100%, you know, and she just said, you know, Flex, nobody can make this decision but you, and I was like, take it, just take it, you know. But um, anyway, my point is, is I don't, I don't feel that I was allowed to do all these things on a global scale and then go and hide when it's happened. And that's why before they even, you know, took my leg, I went on Instagram and I was talking about it because I'm like, you know, I want to be a... I want to be a spokesperson for these people. Um, you know, I want to be a spokesperson for everybody who has dif disabilities because it's just, yeah, you, you just don't think about a lot of things until you're there, you know, and, um, and a lot of these people didn't have my platform. So, you know, I've already discussed with my uh, business partner, I want to open up a nonprofit organization. I want to help people get wheelchairs and amputees and just bring awareness and funds and all that stuff. And, you know, it's not about the money thing for me. It's just, um, it's rough, you know, when you have, and I didn't understand it, to be honest with you, because I made the call and I was fine with it and I was doing videos and I was in a hospital and I told myself, I said, when I wake up after they take my leg, as soon as I look down, if I'm okay with it, I'll be all right. If I freak out, I'm gonna have a bad fight. When I woke up, I was like, I'm okay with this. It was only until I got home and I woke up the next morning in my house upstairs and it, and, uh, and it just like, like the devil just was having his way with me. Just a horrible thought. So it's, wow, last time I was in my home, I had two legs, you know, looking at the staircase and you never really look over the staircase. You look at the stairs cause you're walking at, and I walked to my balcony. I looked over the stairs. I'm like, Jesus. If I fall, and it was just fear. Every time I go up and down my stairs, I'm in fear because if I fall, it's not going to be good. Every picture in my house, every thing that I bought had two legs, and I come back down, and it just really just wore me out. Wow. And I just had to tell myself, and I was really emotional, and I was sitting there with my wife, and um, she was trying to console me, and she kind of backed up. She said, you know what? I don't even know what you're going through. So she just went silent. And um, I said, you know, baby, I'll be okay. I go, but if I really want to sit in front of someone who's going through or went through something that I went through, I got to go through this. I got to go through the hells and the bowels of it deeply if I'm going to sit in front of somebody else and try to help them and pull them out of this darkness because every thought comes to you. Suicide, you're less than a man, you're half a man, you know, you're not worthy, all those things. So I'm like, I really have to deal with every ounce of emotional garbage to be able to truly sit in front of somebody and help them. If not, they're going to see I'm faking, I'm going to lose them, you know? So, um, I really, I really take it on as a blessing. I mean, I don't want to be long winded, but I really need to say this, you know, in this picture, all the great things you said, mm -hmm. you would think this guy just thinks he's pristine. His S H I T don't stink. I was never happy. Never. Like I told you, I never walked on stage and thought I was good enough. Always uncomfortable. No matter what I wore, what I dressed in, my car, am I standing up straight, somebody looking at me, never uncomfortable. Since the first time I tried to commit suicide when I was 11 or 13, never comfortable. For the first time in my life, I'm fully comfortable. Don't bother me, I don't hide it. That's powerful. And so for me, it was a blessing because the man upstairs loved me enough to bless me with this blessing so that I can be happy. I'd rather live 10 more minutes, the man I am now, than another 54 years of the person I was there. So it's a beautiful thing and, I'd be able, and I can help people who really freaking need it, you know, because you, you always look at them and wonder, what's their story? And I see people looking at me, they'll look at me kind of like with pity or sorrow and I'm like, I'm the happiest man in the room right now. You just don't understand, you know. So um, it is rough, and even today, uh, this is the first time getting on an airplane. Terrifying, 
you know. Um, and I actually got emotional because I went to the bathroom and just to be able to use a toilet and have to stand on one leg and this, that, and other. When I got back to my seat, I was just shook and, you know, it was just a lot of first time experiences. Um, terrified. What if the plane goes down? How am I going to get out of here? Normally, I'm the first person on, you know, uh, one of the first people on a plane and first person off. I had to be last this time. Mm. Just a lot of things, you know. Um, so it is an emotional, uh, emotional roller coaster, but I, I take it on with pride because I know I'll be able to do some people a great service. I think the level of impact you can make, make moving forward is going to be much bigger than the impact you made so far. You know, I, I've heard that so many times, and I, I, I do believe it, but, you know, to, to hear something that you already feel or know, by other people kind of reinstates your feeling and I truly hope so because I don't and I tell my kids this all the time I don't want to be known as flex wheeler the bodybuilder who gives a damn you're just an athlete that doesn't show your worth come on we know plenty of people who are millionaires billionaires athletes and they're garbage I don't want to be known as an athlete I just want to be known as a person who is decent who tried to help other people That's you heard you heard what Phil Heath said he says, not Flex Wheeler, the bodybuilder, but Flex Wheeler, the man. Yeah, that's so, what I care so about. So for a guy like that to say that, yeah. and, and, and Phil is also pretty proud. Pri he's very proud of who he is as yeah. well. For him to yeah. say something like that, that's very powerful. So some of the things I'm up to now, um, what has came to the table is like, you know, just the pain. I'm, I'm in pain 24 hours a day, even mm -hmm. now. Um, mm -hmm. It never goes away. Not only the amputee, I have neuropathy in my leg and my hand, so it's just, it's just unspeakable pain. So I've been trying all these various different things, and in a hospital, of course, I, I have them drug me out of my brain just to keep me out of pain. But once I came home, I'm like, I can't do that. I got to own my brain. You know, I, I just can't be a zombie. So I, I've been reading up and hearing about CBD oils, and I've been trying a number of different ones. So I have the tremendous opportunity of coming out with my own line of uh, CBD oils to help people just with the pain that they're going mm -hmm, through and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Again, like we talked about earlier, because now being an amputee and looking at things different, just the comfort of a wheelchair and being able to get around. So I'm releasing my own line of uh, a wheelchair. It's called a flex chair. So electric chair folds is the most compact and powerful uh, wheelchair that's out there in the market right now. Um, we're in a process of devising a blood clot thinner so I lost my leg due to blood clot. Um, that comes along with a, long, or a slew of different other things. So right now with my nutrition company that we're opening up, that's called Iconic Supplements uh, from the one picture. But um, those are one of the things we're working on. So a lot of various different things. Uh, you know, got a tour in Pakistan that I'm looking forward to, tour in India. And those are some of my first tours that I'm good uh, doing. So I'm just trying to open back mm -hmm. up to the world that, mm -hmm. hey, I'm, I'm available to start traveling. So. More so than anything, I'm just trying to create different business adventures that actually help people more than, you know, my, myself because of some of the things I've been through. So, um, some exciting times, you know, well, coming up. respect you for doing that. What we're going to do is we're going to put the link below for all three of them. You can go click on the link below to find out more information. We'll also put all your social media, everything Copy to be that. able to follow him as well. So 2020 predictions, and you think Phil, you think Kai, you think these road, and you think these guys are going to come back and compete 2020 after Brandon Curry winning? Uh, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think Kai will because he's doing so much financially better out mm -hmm. of the sport. Mm -hmm. We were dead, all of us. Kali saved us. Here. In here. Don't get all mushy on the phone. No, no mushy. And I've actually told Kai, you know, why would you ever come back? You know, you, you're going to come back to allow certain people to have power over you when you have endless power globally now and you have nothing to gain financially from it. He's so financially strong. Phil, I don't know. Um, I think he easily come back and be at his best and, and, and win eight and possibly nine. He still has it in him. Um, as an athlete, I don't know if he has it in him as a person because I know he's switching over business-wise. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to him about this, but I just, from his interviews and stuff that I see he's doing, I think he's understanding I can make just as much or more money not having to go through the hell that I look great, you know, continue looking great and continue training, but I don't have to take it to that level of going on stage and I can make more money than that. And if you can, then why would you continue doing that? And honestly, it, it just takes 
a certain mind frame that we have when we're younger to go through hell and enjoy it. You know, it's like having a lower car. That's, but you look good. Mm -hmm. As a gentleman, I don't want a car like that. I want something nice, comfortable, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't know if he has that ability to go back and, and hurt the way he needs to hurt to win. You yeah. don't know if he has. I don't know if he has that in him anymore, you know. Um, and it's not to say that he's not a fighter, but you, you just, you have to understand competing at that level, it's not going to be fun. There's nothing fun about it, you know. He, he still looks good. He's 40, he still, he but, looks you know, great. He has so Talent many. wise, can he do it? Of course he could. Talent wise, can Kai come back and wipe everybody, afford everybody? Of course he could. But it's, is whether you want that fight or mm -hmm. not. And, and on top of that, whether Mr. Olympia brand wants them back, what are they going to do for them to want to come back? Because they got to make it juicy for them to want to Yeah, because they, they, they'll, they'll make it. more money doing a couple of appearances. Of course. And yeah. not even having to take it to the next level of dieting and everything else that comes in detail with it. So yeah. I got to do this since I've been doing this with everyone. I know, I know. Okay, you know I'm this time is it. coming up, so I, 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 let's go through oh, it. So gosh. everyone's been brave to give their feedback. I had mm. to put that adjective in there to kind of uh, Brave, set you I know, up. I know you so are. What do you we discussed this already. <laughs> you Me and Dr. Reeves, we already discussed this. Well, yeah. you know, so he stood up in the back like a signal of, hey, man, you know, yeah. uh, I don't I want you to go. I stood this. up and kind of moved forward a little bit. <laughs> Remember, we talked about this. So, so what would you say with these guys versus your era? You've heard Ronnie. You've heard Dorian. Oh, Ron you got Dre on there? Oh, yeah, cool, I, got, man. I got a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm yeah. diffusing. I'm switching the... Uh, I know you are, but I'm going to come back to Okay. Um, what's your question? So these guys compared to you, compared to your era. I mean, I got to be honest. No, no, no. I mean, um, I competed with two of them and, um, Dexter out of, except Brandon, Dexter was the first to win Olympia. And when we competed on the same stage, I think I was like first and he was like 10th, you know, so it was just different yeah where would they where would this be in your era you saw what ronnie and dorian said where would they rank would they compete with the with with you guys or somebody sean ray lavron cormier would they compete with those guys um no i would have to probably say not not like i just demonstrated uh you know dexter uh, didn't fare all that well against us um no, it's just kind of it's just kind of different, you know. And I don't, I don't mean any disrespect to these gentlemen. I know all of them, and I consider myself, uh, you know, very cordial with all of them. It's not a personal, um, you know. And I can't laugh about it because it's not funny. Because mm -hmm. you're being honest about mm -hmm. men who are working really hard. Um, but no, it, it's it's different. And I think um, if you were to ask any of those gentlemen, they would probably say the same. Do you think it's fair for uh, uh, Roley? The argument he made, he says. It's kind of unfair for the old timers to go at Brandon Curry and say what they're saying. This is a different era, kind of like you know how they compare I agree with basketball. Him. Do you kind of agree with what I agree he's with saying? Him because you know it's about getting your point across, but not being harsh. There's no need to be harsh mm. or or malice or, or or hurt a person's feeling. You know, so that's why I'm being very uh, cordial and persuasive with my words and stuff. Saying yeah, yeah, they can compete with their garbage. No. These men are champions. It's just a different era, and it's not fair uh, to compare them because we're not in that era. And you know what? It doesn't matter because this man right here and this man right here has Olympias, and I don't. So who gives a damn, right? Because they are Miss Olympians, and they'll go down as known as Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. So what difference does it make? They won Mr. Olympias in their era, so they're the best at their, their craft during that time. And definitely, Roley is definitely considered one of the best. I mean... It's amazing. I want to say this because he gave me one of the greatest comments ever. You know, it was a video and he said, you know, I think if I want to be any bodybuilder in the world, I'd be Flex. He was just flawless. If I could be anybody, I'd be him. And for Roley to be as massive and in shape and just, physique. Yeah. to say that, I just yeah. I had to send him a message like, wow, man, thank you. That is, wow. That's cool. Yeah, so. And by the way, Brandon Curry, I got to tell you, what a classy guy. 100%. You know, what 100%. a classy guy. Mm -hmm. Just came here, you know, I'm like, and the way he handled it because it's yeah. the pressure and yeah. who wants to do that after you just won and right. come in and I'm like, you know, 
He I've seen agreed. his interview. I, I even I, seen his interview after what Dorian said. I've seen, yeah, yeah. To yeah. me, I think he gained respect. I'm, I'm not saying you know points on who's the greatest. All this. I think he gained respect as a man and a person. I yeah, think he definitely. gained respect. I've been knowing Brandon forever. Actually, when he was an amateur, I was covering him, and I gave him the nickname Soul Brother Number One. You Soul know, Brother Number yeah, One. Yeah, because if you look, he looked like a character from Shaft or something like that, right? So um, what he's been able to do in his um, his vision and his thought and self belief in himself. Uh, paid the way for him to be the man he is now and a champion. We're at the end of it. I got a couple things I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a video here, and then I'll do a speed run and we'll be done. Okay. okay. So if, when you see these pictures, what do you think about? Trying to be like Prince. Trying to be like Prince with Prince the hair. Prince got the women, man. Yeah. I mean, come <laughs> on. So you were a Prince guy. You were oh, hell yeah. Yeah. 100%. Only concert I ever went to in my entire life to this day, Prince. How old are you on the right? Just a kid who's trying... Um, are you 20 or are you uh, 20? I'm 20. Yeah. Uh, I think that's after I went to Cal. So, yeah, I'm about 22 um, there, 22, 23. Just, I just looked at that kid and said, you know, you have no idea what's ahead of you, son. You know, I feel bad for you in some ways and good for the other. Only concert you've been in is Prince. I caught that. That's pretty yeah. sick. The only one you've ever been. Hey, man. Just Did you ever see Michael Jackson perform? Or no, nah, never got to see him perform. So, to, you know, Michael J like, I never watched Michael play, Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. I never watched Michael Jackson perform. Mm -hmm. But Prince is one of the legendary performers of all time. So when you what do you think about when you see this guy? Just innocent, man. I won my first honor classic, and I had no idea of what it even meant. I just, I just knew what the check was. That's it. That's, what did you do afterwards this night? Uh, I went to my room and ate pizza. That's it. Yeah, just went and ate pizza, and that was it. You know, another way to celebrate. Yeah, and I had to forget about it. I remember telling myself, "That's who kibs the damn." You know, you got to show next weekend. You're gonna get the floor mop with you if you want to party about what you did a few hours ago. So. Th this picture, this doesn't make any sense to me when I see this picture of you. Like, I know it's probably not the. It, this picture is like, you know, this this looks like a statue yeah. with the with the with the deaf. I mean, that's just insane right there. I don't there. know how I achieved that because I didn't know anything about <laughs> dieting. I didn't know anything about dieting whatsoever. Paul, what do you think about this when you see this? It's just ridiculous <laughs> to me. I go home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> this one is a classic one. Uh, just uh, us uh, doing battle, man. Yeah. Three of the greatest of all times. And we were just deeply friends. We had tremendous respect for each other. But, man, we try to take each other's head off on stage. And then hugs and smiles afterwards. Any, any stories of Kevin we don't know about? Any unique um, stories of Kevin? I said it before. Kevin, you know, we had a lot of respect for each other. Um, he beat me in the Nationals. He turned pro before I did, and I hated him for it. And I chased him, um, and I ended up beating him at, at the first Honor Classic. And um, back then, it was just magazines. And he would always be mouthy in the magazines and all that. And he said, uh, Flex, I hear you knock, but you can't come in. And I said, you know, Fle uh, Kevin, I don't knock on doors. I knock them over. Watch out. You know, so we're just... <laughs> But it was all beef talk. I mean, when we got together, it was nothing but mutual respect. How is he as a, how is he as a guy? Is he, Great. Is tremendous, he, tremendous, yeah, I, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. I, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of you, I don't know personality-wise with how he is, but Hollywood, you know, a lot of good-looking guys. And he's, he could have been a, yeah, one he of did. these, you know, a lot of these guys you see right now that are bodybuilders and they're fighters and they're movies now because they had physiques. There's a mm -hmm. lot of guys that are doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there could have been some opportunities there for him. This video here, okay? I'm nervous. Uh, when, you, when you think about movies, how many, you know, in movies, they, they, there's all these bodybuilders, all these Mr. Olympias, but in this movie, they quote you. I mean, it's, it's... John Q. John Q. Jeez. Flex Willen, 275 pounds, 2% body fat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, baby. It was amazing. Actually, the director of the movie, um, was the brother of one of my trainers. So in that movie, um, remember Denzel got shot. Mm -hmm. One of my trainers was the person who shot him. In the movie? In the movie. And his brother was the director wow. of the movie. So how that happened was he was training his brother, and then I would train um, afterwards. And sometimes he would hang over and watch. And uh, after about a year, um, his brother said, um, wow, you guys are amazing. I got to give tribute to you guys somehow. The hard work, you just, you just look at you. You don't think of that. And then he came back and he asked me, he goes, Flex, I have this movie. Can I use your name and likeness? And I'm like, yeah, sure. No, so they yeah. asked you before they used it? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. His brother did. Uh, and I just, I couldn't believe it because um, I had been through a car accident. So I was eager to watch the movie and it started off with that horrific car accident. Just, and it grabbed me because I'd been through. So, and I have a son 
I have two sons, so the, what wouldn't you do for your, 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 your so the movie just what hooked me and wouldn't let movie, me go. By the way. Yeah, yeah, amazing. But um, that's just beautiful, man. Just again, you know, to end it by, you know, saying just to be, you know, accepted for your craft and what you've done and uh, not viewed whether you're black or white or straight or gay or anything. I think everybody in the world is striving to do that in their various different ways. So to be respected that way and somebody think I have some self-worth or value is just uh, from this little kid that come from the ghetto in Fresno is just... You know how many posters you've been on? How many walls you've been on, man? Like how many kids like that's not just a movie scene, man. That's like yeah. real lifetimes millions. This last one here I want since we're doing this. This is your guy and here's what he says about you, okay? I want to see what you think about when you listen to this. You know what's crazy about Flex? <laughs> Everybody views him as one of the greatest bodybuilders Never. Ever. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Who are your top five? See, I got Arnold, I got Lee, I got Phil, Flex, and Kevin. Ahead of Dorian? See, like, you wouldn't put Dorian ahead of Flex? No, no, I got, I got Flex ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest difference for wow. you from Kevin and Flex's physique? Flex had better shape. He had better shape. Yeah, I think Flex had better shape than me. Are you in contact right now with Flex? Yeah, my best friend in the world. Yeah. Just was texting him yesterday. He just had surgery again. Can't believe it. You know, again, um, like I said, I don't think anyone's ever going to beat what Ronnie brought to the table. They might beat his, um, his number, but they, you can't take a best of all time pitcher and match it up against him and, and be defeated. And uh, we just always hit it off. We were always friends. And, uh, and our friendship really, truly was tested when he turned around and beat me for the first time because that's when he find out what was really going on, right? And we just stayed the test of time, and uh, you know, I just want to give him a shout out. He just had a hip replacement again, you know, just yesterday, and uh, and we talk. You know, we both been through some extraordinary pain, and I'm like, man, I'm bleeding for you. He goes, no, it's okay. You know, it's okay. He goes, uh, still haven't caught up to you in your surgeries. I'm like, you don't want that record. He goes, no, I don't. <laughs> he goes, I don't want that record. So, wow. He's a, he's another humble guy, man. Here's a guy that can be cocky just a humble guy yeah man, that you that you like quick quick speed run i'll give you some names some of the first thing that comes to mind dennis james true friend by the way he sent me the link he says pat i watch your interviews here's what we're doing for sultan with the gofundme and that's when we put yeah. the, we supported but he I was just so you yeah. know he's the one that reached out nobody wow. else dennis is the one i don't know if you know this you need to know it i didn't dennis sent a message and then we shared it or else we wow. wouldn't know about it yeah wow wow uh, uh, uh one word dorian yates Just uh, competitive, you know, during this era on stage, unbreakable. Unbreakable. Yeah. Lee Priest. Wow, Lee. A jack of all trades and a master of many. And a master of many. Yeah. Paul Dillette. Uh Didn't get his due. Just uh, if he was competing now, he would be unbreakable on stage. There would be nobody who can do anything about Interesting. it. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Nasrul Sambati. Tremendous friend. I remember the first time competing against him when he turned pro and just tragic loss to our sport. Aaron Baker. God, Batman. The true Batman. It always broke my heart. Um, Aaron was uh, top 10 in the world and he always had to work two jobs. He never got a fair shake. And I know he was always upset about the one show I beat him in after, right after my car accident. Um, but just, you just have no idea how gifted that guy was. He could draw. I remember him doing fencing against pros mm -hmm. in a, in Goes Gym parking lot. Just fencing? Fencing. Wow. And they were going to bring him on a team, wrestling, everything. <laughs> just, just amazing. Yeah, true Batman. Cormier. Wow. Um, true friend. One of the strongest bodybuilders I ever trained with. The strongest bodybuilder I ever trained with. Don't mess with him. I heard six plates on incline. I yeah, heard some don't mess like with him. That. Don't mess with him when it comes to trying to out, out, out train him. Yeah. Sean Ray. Sean Ray. Jeez, I already gave it away with my facial expression. Um, you know, <clears throat> tremendous athlete. Um, very on top of his game as a business person. Uh, someone I looked up for years and wanted to emulate and taught me a lot in the sport.
safe. Very, you should run for office. That was, that was good. <laughs> Chad, say, Chad Nichols. Chad Nichols, wow. Um, not sure where, I, where I'd be without him. Yeah, taught me a lot. Um, in an age of gurus, um, he taught me that flex, you know more about you than me. The only reason I can help you is if you understand your body well enough to explain it to me that I can give you advice. What a way to put it. Yeah. Powerful. He's like, you're with yourself 24 hours a day. I'm not. Yeah. Jay Cutler. True champion, businessman, great person. Um, love him a lot. Great guy. Great guy. Mike Matarazzo. <sighs> Mike was a very close friend. We traveled the world together. Um, just tremendous losses broke my heart um, when he passed. But man, we had some great battles together. Incredible champion. You guys were on, you, you were good on ESPN, by the way. Too. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I'm going to beat you, Mr. California, all this stuff you guys were doing. Yeah. It looked like you guys were having fun. Lee Haney. A man's man, a champion's champion. Uh, you never heard him say nothing bad about anybody. Been married to the same woman since high school. You don't hear nothing negative. You, in every sport, every business, you hear, you never hear nothing bad about him. Respect. Just, just a champion's champion. Sergio God. Oliva. I met him um, before he passed, and he was always just an amazing person and force, and just to hear his story. And my first Olympia, um, when I was going back into the hotel, it was him who opened the door for me. I was like, oh, my God. You know? And he goes, Flex, you won that show. Don't let nobody tell you different. You won that show. I was like, I don't care about that, man. I just met you. You know, can I shake your hand? And now I'm having the honor to be friends, you know, with his son, who's just carrying a torch for him. Just, yeah, there's, there's people who are anchors in business or sports or life. And he's truly an anchor in our sport. Brother, this is, uh, it's felt like five minutes, but I think it's been two hours. I don't know uh, exactly what the time's been. It's felt like five minutes to me because the conversation's been just purely fascinating <laughs> going through, you know, history with you. I appreciate you making the time to come out and sitting down here with us and opening up, talking to us, just sharing us with uh, where your heart's at. And uh, I hope all the listeners that are listening in, any links that he has, we're putting below. Go send him some love, whether it's on Instagram. I think you're most active on Instagram. Yeah. Send him a message. And uh, if in the future you ever want to come back to talk uh, any other bodybuilding, any other story, man, if you're always open to come back here. Truly, pleasure having you as a guest, man. Appreciate you. First and foremost, it, it takes people like you um, for even people like me to be noticed. So, you know, kudos go to you first for even having interested in our sport uh, for even thinking that I have anything of value to talk to on your tremendous outreach that you have. So uh, being able to sit here in front of a person who comes from a whole different background and him having an interest in me is just, it's uh, solidifying. It makes you feel, you know, you're, you're worthy. So, you know, thank you so much in the time and effort that you put in all this to have such a premiere show. It's what you don't understand is, uh, and what most people don't understand is, the honor is really mine because I get to go to different parts of the world and I'm just accepted for me as a person. And, you know, you being Persian and, and all that, you, you know what that's like of being accepted. So again, you know, I'll, I'll end it with just, the honor is mine just to be accepted for my strengths, my weaknesses, my setbacks, my shortcomings and all that is just, yeah, I, I can never thank people like you, you know, enough who thinks that you know, I have something to offer. So, um, yeah, it goes back to you, Tim Full. Impact with you is just getting warmed up, man. I'm telling you, it's just getting warmed up. And, Doc, I got to tell you, thanks for making this work as well. I know we're going back and forth. <laughs> Flex, appreciate you, man. Thanks thank for coming Thank you so on. much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This was pleasure. Great. Thank you. So obviously you saw myself and Flex talk about Dorian Yates as well as Ronnie Coleman. A lot of stories there. So if you haven't yet watched the Ronnie Coleman interview, click over here. And if you haven't watched the Dorian Yates interview, click over here. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.